Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks, and I am uh, happy that you are joining us. Those of you that have watched and listened to the show know that I speak to really smart and great authors of some great and smart business books. Uh, today, I have a friend of mine on the on, on the call here or on the video. His name is Pete Fader. Pete has written a book called The Customer-Based Audit, The First Step on the Journey to Customer Centricity. First of all, Pete, let me say hello and welcome. It's great to see you. Dan, it's always good to talk to you. It is great. I think the last time you and I saw each other was at one of the uh, Phillies postseason games. Phillies, actually. San Diego National Championship Series. That was it, exciting. It's a whole other story to tell. Uh, we <laughs> went to every postseason game, by the way, that that uh, this past fall. But again, that's another story for another time. We don't have to, we don't have to bore people with. So, Pete, you wrote this book uh, with two of your colleagues, Bruce Hardy and Michael Ross. So, before we get into you. Tell us a little bit about Bruce and Michael. Hi, I appreciate the chance to do that. Uh, not only to give credit where it's due, but to acknowledge that my name is first on this thing, but but those guys really did most of the heavy lifting. Uh, the heart and soul of this book is Bruce Hardy, a former PhD student of mine from many years ago, a longtime professor at the London Business School. And a lot of the work that I've been doing the broader academic agenda and so on. It's really, Bruce has been the engine of, of all of that. Um, this book, which of course we'll talk about, mm -hmm. is, not, is his idea. Uh, I was actually looking at old emails. I found one from, I think, 18 years ago, where he said, we need to write a book called The Customer Base Audit. So he is really the, the, the motivation. Uh, he did most of the, the organizing, the writing, the analyzing. Uh, but he's a really low-key, humble guy. I'm sure that not a single one of your listeners has has uh, heard of Bruce or interacted with him. Uh, he 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 really doesn't seek attention. He just seeks to create useful knowledge. Uh, and I hope that this book uh, fits well with that. Uh, and then there's Michael Ross. Uh, right. So Michael is a practitioner, also over in the UK. Uh, although that's uh, that's largely coincidence. Uh, he's uh, someone who's just been in this, I mean, the guy's brilliant, worked with McKinsey, uh, and he's just, uh, as he likes to call himself, a data agitator. He, like so many other smart people, have been kind of making up analyses to fit specific kinds of business settings. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, a lot of the stuff he was just kind of stumbling upon or, or making up just happened to fit amazingly well Coincid pure coincidence with the work that Bruce and I were doing. And it was around 10 years ago, 15 years ago, through a different PhD student who introduced us and boom. And as it stands now, Bruce and Michael co-teach a course at the London Business School. So in some sense, the two of them are, are really, really close. And again, it was teaching that course, it was interacting with students and companies uh, that brought a lot of these ideas together. So it's, it really is a privilege for me to more or less jump on their bandwagon uh, and and be a, a kind of a third wheel. Uh, but it's been just a real pleasure. We all bring very different kinds of skills and perspectives. Uh, and in the end, you know, we, we each uh, contribute a lot to it, even if it was Bruce who actually put a lot of those words on paper uh, more than Michael or myself. That is great. So you uh, currently, and we're going to get into your whole history, but uh, right now you are Professor Wharton. Tell us what you teach. So I have been a professor at Wharton since 1987, back in the days <laughs> really, of you were marketing. That old. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. uh, when marketing was just all about just kind of creativity and fluff and just a lot of the stereotypes that that used to be widely held and still are today, to, but to a lesser extent. Uh, and so I've been pushing for 30 plus years to make marketing a, a legitimate science. I don't want marketing science to be seen as an oxymoron anymore. And uh, yeah. we've come a long way. I'm just really happy both to to ride that wave as well as create a lot of the content and 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 perspectives and applications that have helped create it. Uh, so that, that's what I've been doing at Wharton. Uh, I've always been very practical. I don't want to build models just because I can get another academic publication. Right. I mean, there's no doubt that I live in a published or perish world, but there's no reason why publishing has to be, go against the grain of being practical. So always trying, in fact, very often the, the problems I'm working on and developing new academic approaches to uh, are questions that companies have been asking. You know, so how do we forecast this? How do we do that? How do we work with this kind of data source or combine these data sources? So, so taking just, just real practical but, but sophisticated problems and then figuring out what's the, 
the, the best way to approach them, both from a math standpoint, computation, interpretations, uh, just, uh, you know, decision making. Right. So, so that's what I do. It's, uh, and along the way, I'll, I'll take a lot of this academic work and commercialize it because there's just no better way to impact practice than to roll up your sleeves and do it yourself. Uh, happy to talk about all that. Well, you talk about commercializing it. Um, tell us about Zodiac. Sure thing. So, uh, so the, the the main work that I've done for the past twenty plus years has been on customer lifetime value. Right. Words that I know are part of your vocabulary and just a lot of the folks listening. Now that wasn't true 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, people either never heard of it, or even if they did, they didn't quite understand what it meant. And even if they did, they wouldn't know how to calculate it. And even if they did, they wouldn't know what to do with it. So again, that's been my job is to motivate a CLV or LTV uh, to carefully define it, to do some, some pretty sophisticated math underneath it. Um, and then to demonstrate to people why they should use that as their North Star. And that's what Zodiac did. Because after years and years of writing papers and putting out code, it's all out there in the public domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of companies using some of that work. But if you really want to get them to do it the right way, you got to give them the right stuff. Uh, and so along with uh, uh, several uh, other former students, most notably, a gentleman named Dan McCarthy, a name that we'll doubtlessly talk about uh, more through the session. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, co-founded this company called Zodiac to bring lifetime value to life at full commercial scale. Show people that this is a real thing. You really can do it. It really can be impactful. And then we work with tons of, you name it, retail, travel and hospitality, gaming, uh, telcos, uh, uh, financial services, pharmaceuticals, to basically show the value of their customers, whether they're consumers, physicians, distributors. I don't care about the B2B versus B2C thing. As long as you have customers, then, then these concepts matter. Uh, and it was super fun for me personally. It was like, whoa, this stuff really works. Like, right. And it works again. Well, so when you say, when you say though it really works, I mean, what you know, what's the outcome of this type of predictive analytics? Like why... Why do I want to know what the lifetime value is of my customers and how do I profit from that? Yeah, I love it. So, of course, we're going to answer that to talk more about the so what mm -hmm. that arises from it. But but uh, and, and for some people asking that question, people will sometimes ask it a lot more skeptically than you just did. Um, they'll say, what, what does this concept mean? So yeah. very often we'll kind of bring it down a level instead of lifetime value is this kind of ethereal, uh, almost intangible thing. Let's basically boil it down to three different components. How long is the relationship with this customer going to last? And how long will they at least consider buying from us? Mm -hmm. So, you know, a customer retention. Obviously, I don't need to motivate that one. So let's let's predict, predict that really accurately over really long horizons and at a really granular level to basically say for a you know, customer like you or for customers who share the same rel relevant characteristics, what percent of them will stay with us three, five, 10, 20 years? Customer retention, that's number one. Number two, <clears throat> over that horizon, um, how many interactions will you do with us? How many purchases will you make? Or how many sales calls will you take? Or how many times you, will you at least consider us in some kind of RFP process? So just how many economically relevant interactions will there be? Mm -hmm. uh, and so again, we can predict that out. And the third one would be, how much value is generated by those interactions? So quite simply, how much do you spend when you make a purchase? Hmm. So we look at customer retention, repeat purchase and spend, just to simplify it a little bit. Each one by itself, very interesting. In right. fact, we might just stop there. But when you bring them all together, that's lifetime value. Uh, and so having this kind of composite measure of all the good things that customers can do uh, should be the, the right way to both drive decisions that you make about customer experience or investments in products or whatever, uh, as well as to evaluate those mm -hmm. investments. That's where lifetime value comes in handy. You mentioned that um, customers it really should make a difference whether they're B2B or B2C, but I'm assuming that the methodology to predict their behavior 
is different between the two types of customers. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about I sure can. Some of those the methodology types. is surprisingly similar. The way I look at it is the, the, the biggest distinction that we have to worry about isn't B2B or B2C, isn't big company versus small company. It's contractual versus non-contractual. It is a subscription-based business or are they more or less discretionary purchases? Hmm. Uh, and as, as you and the listeners know, that distinction very much transcends B2B versus B2C. So on the subscription side, we could be talking about some kind of enterprise-wide communication software sure. like Slack or something like that, sure. or it could be the beer of the month club or Netflix or something like that. In both cases, it's 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 this fairly easy question: How long until you drop the subscription? Right over that horizon, the interactions, the payments will tend to be pretty steady, both in timing and size. So that's an easy business. But it gets much harder when it's discretionary purchases. And again, it could be someone buying stuff from a grocery store, or it could be an airline uh, buying uh, parts and equipment from you know the Boeing's and Airbuses. Uh, so. You know, you make these purchases. Sometimes you make a whole big batch of them at once. You know, you're moving, so you go to Home Depot a lot. Um, or sometimes you might go a year or two without making a purchase. Doesn't mean you're gone. Mm -hmm. This means you're dormant between purchases. Uh, so the timing of the purchases varies. The size of the purchases vary. And the tough part is, unlike the subscription setting, you never know if the customer is alive or dead. So, you know, you used to purchase a lot for me. You haven't been around for a while. I'm not so sure that you're sure. still around. Sure. It becomes more of a guess. It becomes more probabilistic. Right. And that's where these models tend to be amazingly useful. It's to say, what's the probability, given your history, that you're still alive as a customer? Right. And then to use that as the basis for a communication strategy uh, and just every kind of tactic you can imagine. So to do this kind of predictive analytics, would your clients hire Zodiac? And I, I realize you sold Zodiac back in 2018. So it, it no longer, I guess you're no longer involved with the company. Um, but would your clients use you primarily for, you know, for, for surveying their customers? You know, like if I'm a large company and I'm trying to figure out what that lifetime value is with my customers, we need to know more about why our customers are either buying or stop buying from us. Right. So it, I, I, I don't... I don't see how companies can keep that amount of data just in their normal transactions. There has to be outreach to the customers. I correct? love it. So that 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 issue by itself, what kind of data is available? That's where we'll see some big differences between B2B and B2C. And even among right. B2C firms, uh, if they're buying online, it's easy. But if they're paying cash, tricky. So, so it's that kind of question that kind of keeps me gainfully employed as a professor <laughs> to basically do the math and come up with the models that would work for, for different kinds of data inputs. And I'm happy to talk for days about that. Again, that's my, that's my day job. Yeah. I, don't, I won't bore you or your listeners with that, but I do have. I am know, curious whole... about a few of those data inputs though. <laughs> and, and, and if anyone else is curious, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, Gene, at the end of this. Uh, what I call my uh, CLV starter kit, where <laughs> okay. I point out some of the easier, more accessible papers, as well as some of the publicly available code. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and it's usually in R or Python, but you can do this stuff. Like when I teach it to the students here at Wharton, I do it all in Excel. Okay. Uh, so, so there's actually a lot of good resources available. Now, what we've done commercially is we've upped the ante quite a bit. We've brought in lots of other bells and whistles and computational capabilities and all sorts of stuff that, mm -hmm. frankly, I don't even fully understand. <laughs> but we hire really good people who, who do that. Uh, and again, and we'll, we'll bring the models to life. Back to your question, a wide variety of use cases. Mm -hmm. Some companies that have already seen seen the light they found religion and they want to use lifetime value to drive and evaluate marketing programs they get it others who just want to deal with one of those one layer down tactics um, others who have very different purposes in mind one of the things that i know we'll talk about is the idea of customer-based corporate valuation these days i'm spending a lot of time talking to private equity firms mm to say that using all that customer data can let us do corporate valuation mm. more accurately and more diagnostically than the usual top-down financy ways. We, we can talk more about that. So quite a variety of use cases. At Zodiac, we're basically creating 
more and more and more of these use cases, right. uh, kind of just an ever longer list. It's like, huh, I never really thought about that application before. Right. Uh, and, uh, and it was it was glorious because even though I've, I'm the one kind of putting a lot of the stuff out there, I'm also always learning. And we were actually uh, working on a book that would have been, you know, here basically here's the 50 fun things to do with lifetime value once you have it. Um, uh, but then, of course, as, as you mentioned, uh, Zodiac got purchased by Nike back in 2018, so it kind of put a hold on on some of that. Uh, but uh, but that that by itself uh, had involved a lot of learning and uh, and was a great outcome. I got to imagine that a lot of this, uh, you know, a lot of these opportunities for you to do this kind of work has because of the explosion in big data um, over the past 30 years. I mean, I don't think you could have even begun to do this kind of research and kind of consulting work for bigger companies without the kind of data that's available today. And I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on how has that impacted this type of you know predictive analytics? There is no question. Again, I've been just a wonderful, uh, a very grateful beneficiary yeah. uh, of that. Now, I teach this, this course at Wharton and there's lots of online versions available. Happy to send you some links. Uh, and I used to beg people just to make sure I could still teach the course. I mm -hmm. beg people, please, please take my course so I could get maybe, you know, eight or 10 people to take it. <laughs> and today, uh, well, I'll be starting the course up in, in mid January and I'll have, you know, 250 in there and a wait list just as long. Um, so it's, uh, so uh, there's no question. There's a lot of people who in the past wouldn't have been interested in this stuff sure. who are now not only interested, but making it the, highest priority for their career. So that's the good news is just having smart people, better data sources, a better variety of managerial questions. I don't have to sell lifetime value as much as I used to. On the other hand, uh, there, there's a, I, I do worry that maybe some of the people coming in aren't as sharp. You know, they're doing it for opportunistic reasons as opposed to pure passion. Number one. Number two, a lot of the data sources that we associate with big data, a lot of the really cool data sources, things like um, social interactions or things like what people are thinking or things like where their eyes are looking or mm -hmm. just a lot of the really cool stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I'm interested in, but aren't really useful for my stuff, for customer lifetime value. Because in my world, if I just want to predict behavior, who's going to buy what when, Nothing predicts behavior better than behavior, <laughs> past behavior. Right. So part of it is having the discipline to know where to draw the line and say enough's enough. That other stuff, it's nice to know, but I don't really want that. So that's problem number two. And problem number three, and again, it's, it's, it's a good news, bad news thing, would be all the interest today on AI and machine learning and people yeah. thinking if we could just you know, throw this data into some kind of big black box, it's going to just tell us who's yeah. going to buy what when. And it's not quite that simple. Uh, the, the approaches that I use, and again, I don't want to get too deep into it now, sure. is not machine learning. It's something that's actually much simpler. It's not my objective to build the best fitting model because I want to make long run forecasts. Right. So it's very important for me to keep it simple. The right. Occam's razor, tell the simplest story that gets the job done. Uh, and so, again, having the discipline to know where to draw the line, not only with the data, but with the models and the computation. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm open minded and I always consider new data sources and computational methods. Sure. Uh, but but I have really high bar uh, that, that needs to be hit if I'm going to start changing my tune. Pete, tell me about your first book. It's called Customer Centricity. What what do you mean by customer centricity? OK, so, you know. Early 2000s, along with Bruce Hardy, uh, we basically stumbled into and then started refining a lot of these models in lifetime value, uh, purely academic. So there were a whole other bunch of papers in from like 2004 to 12, thereabouts. Um, and these models were really good. Mm -hmm. And I'd go to anyone who would listen and I'd say, here, please take these models, use them. Whether you want the the whole enchilada, lifetime value, or just some of these separate components, this is the way to do it. Please go to it. And again, people would push back, thinking it's academic, thinking it's not part of their daily workflow. They wouldn't know what to do with it. And that's when I wrote book number one, to basically take a lot of these ideas, 
And I don't want to say dumb them down, not at all. I, I, I'd like to believe that people will find this to be a stimulating, fascinating read, but to basically say why this stuff matters. Okay. That if you if you if you ignore all that customer data, if you simply keep focusing on product, 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 you can't grow like you used to. You're going to be missing an opportunity. So so the the name of that book, Customer Centricity, it's not very useful by itself. A lot of people misinterpret it. It's the subtitle. Here you go, Gene. Read this. Read the subtitle. Focus on the right customers for strategic advantage, right? Your your premise in this book is that not all customers are created equal. And exactly. smart companies recognize that and leverage that fact, right? That, that's it. And that's why I wrote book number one. As we as we found in a lot of the, the research, that there's going to be this small but mighty core of customers. We all kind of understand 80-20 rule. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, so it's not a total surprise. But really bringing it to life and talking about cautionary tales of companies that fail to pay enough attention to it, as well as, you know, positive stories of companies that did. Mm. Uh, and, and that's what book number one is about. It's more motivational, definitional. It's like, why should we think about running our business a different way? Uh, mm. So it really is more about that. Just initial ideas, toes in the water. Uh, I, I don't I don't overemphasize the lifetime value models. There's no math or nasty stuff in this book. That's why I wrote this. It's yep. to aim at a very different audience than the kind of, you know, geeks and nerds. And I say that lovingly um, who would ordinarily uh, be looking for my kind of work. It opened up an entirely different audience. And I, and I can't believe it because it's a nothing little book. You'll, you'll, you won't find it in bookstores. It's really only available online. But we've still managed to sell near, nearly 100,000 copies of this thing because a lot of companies either uh, are finding that growth has plateaued and they can't find a way to break out of the pack using product-centric views, um, or uh, they've, on their own, sort of like Michael Ross, as we mentioned before, have been doing some of these kinds of things and just need a little bit more of a roadmap, a little bit more motivation to say, see, I'm not alone with this. You know, there's other people doing it too, to try to bring a community of like-minded people together. Uh, and on that dimension, it's succeeded beyond my wildest imagination. So, you know, what I've been seeing a lot of over the past year or so, uh, you know, I, I speak, um, you know, 50, 60 times a year to like business associations and industry groups, and, and I do a lot of writing and uh, and most of my, my my audience, Pete, is like small and mid-sized businesses, so not big brands. But um, I've noticed this big change, you know, with inflation being what it was, you know, what it is, supply chain issues, putting a lot of pressure on margins among companies. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of my clients and a lot of my readers, a lot of my community doing something um, a little different than like what their parents and grandparents did back in the late 70s and early 80s when inflation was, you know, that was the last time we were dealing with inflation like this. And that is um, they're leveraging data that their parents and grandparents never really had. I mean, most small and mid-sized businesses have QuickBooks and Epicor and Macola and you know Dynamics, you know, accounting systems. And some of the smarter ones, my, my clients have been, you know, they've really been segregating out those customers that are, you know, more equal than others. You know, um, they're doing it purely on, on sales and they're doing it purely on margins and, and products that they're purchasing. I'm watching them. They're targeting their price increases. They're not just saying we're going to have a 8% price increase across the board. They're saying, you know, what, we're going to increase prices for this people because our margins are lower with this group, but we're actually not going to touch this customer because they're a really good one and have been long-term. That is it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. These kinds of things have been happening organically, yeah. but very often they've been ha happening just at the kind of tactical level that you just mentioned. It'll happen a little bit with pricing, it'll happen a little bit with, with service. And yes. I wanna say it's an overarching strategy that should not only connect all of those tactics, but should be of, of high priority to everybody in the organization, not just the marketing people. We wanna get finance and accounting and supply chain and even talent management uh, on board with these ideas. So we're not just doing them at the margin, we're, we're, we're doing this to really drive the, the overall business. True, but customer centricity as you, and by the way, for, for those of you guys watching, Pete gave a great talk at an Authors at Google event um, a few years ago. You can find it online. Um, you know, he discusses the whole concept of, of customer centricity. It goes beyond though, just financial metrics, right? I mean, there, there are other factors that you need to keep in mind when you're trying to evaluate those long-term best customers, correct? 
Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm now going to almost contradict myself. Again, my job is to make the models as simple as possible to yeah. get those good forecasts. But a lot of businesses will have some idiosyncratic aspects that go beyond the who, what, what, when. Great example would be pharmaceuticals. Because mm -hmm. using these models, if we, if we focus purely on transactions, then, let, oh, let's go find the sickest people. Well, that's not good. Right. So part of lifetime value of, of a customer, of a patient, would be lengthening their life, would be getting them to buy our products less often. Mm -hmm. So bringing in metrics about uh, about kind of persistence, compliance, adherence to, to their medication, uh, uh, you know, a, a quality of life kinds of metrics. So, so in a lot of settings, bringing in some measures that might be uh, harder to, to measure and compare, even to capture the data, uh, sometimes it's going to be really, really important. So in, in many cases, again, for small business, B2B setting, where it, it's going to be looking at relationship building activities, not just transactions, keeping track of who did we take to play golf? Uh, and then how did that uh, relate to future orders that they booked and, and things like that? Uh, so, uh, so a lot of the stuff that companies would ordinarily be tracking in some kind of CRM system, yep, yep. but not necessarily tying it together with purchasing and not necessarily tying it together with future purchasing. That's where this stuff starts to come. And what's interesting is that for SMBs, uh, especially if, if you have a relatively small customer base, mm -hmm. and you kind of know each one and you kind of know uh, what makes them different and you know the you know the, the 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 birthdays for their kids and spouses and all that sort of thing you're already doing the customer centric thing but the problem is if you're doing it in that informal intuitive way it doesn't scale right and so as you start opening that second office moving to a different geography uh, you got to start relying on the data a little bit more than just that that sheer intuition that's what I mean by customer centricity is letting data analytics and technology uh, take over for intuition, doing the things that are intuitively sensible, uh, but doing it in a way where it's just uh, it's more accountable, where you can actually uh, feel better about, you know, letting people lower in the organization run with it. And you can feel better about showing what sharing what you're doing to your external partners and stakeholders to say, Here's why I know it's working. Here's why this particular investment in this customer experience campaign is worth it. That's right. what customer centricity enables. I get for most companies that they're, um, you, you, you talk about data and analytics. Companies have ERP systems. We have CRM systems. People have HR systems. They have project management systems. Uh, they have customized proprietary databases that manage inventory and orders. So there is internal data and, you know, and in some cases it's shittier than others, you know, but there is data that you can at least start with. I'm curious, Pete, if you have any advice, you know, for people listening that are interested in, in taking it a step further, where, what, where else can people go to get data on their customers that might not necessarily be internal data? Yeah, is I it love that. Yes, indeed. Because that, that is... Uh, that's been a great area of research that I've been pursuing for, for quite a while. Again, I've been doing it almost as an academic exercise, asking exactly yeah. that question. Suppose the data we have, it's good. You know, everything we have, we, we trust, but it's incomplete. Right. There, there's, there's either behavioral aspects uh, that aren't being covered or there are particular customers uh, who, who, we, who aren't covered in, in the data. Again, they might be paying cash. So we're going to want to find external data sources and then figure out how to marry it together. Right. So the external data sources could be things like um, from, from you know, third party research firms that are doing a lot of syndicated research. So for instance, in, in the packaged goods world, you could get data from um, IRI or Nielsen uh, that would just give you, let's say, uh, just aggregate information about what your customers are doing, not necessarily the granular stuff. Right. Or a great source that we've been leveraging recently would be credit card panel data. So there's all these different firms out there, Second Measure, Earnest Research, many, many others, who just are basically scraping credit card data. Uh, and again, it can give you a, a, a picture that's nice, it's delicious, yeah. but it's incomplete. Right. So can we take the internal data that's accurate but limited, but the external data that's rich but non-representative and find a way to fuse it together. Now, I'll be the first to admit, that's hard. 
Yeah. That's why you need academics to produce yes. that stuff. And we have a bunch of papers that do it. So I'm not saying it's easy. And I and I wish I could say, yeah, but here's a quick and dirty way to uh, we're still we're working on ways to a pro, to to bring these data sources together in ways that are more computationally feasible. But that's that's the frontier. Yeah. Uh, and at least we we know what should be done. Now it's a matter of just making it even more practical than than some of the leading edge methods we've developed. This book is all about your newest book is about you know auditing your customers and and it's you say it's the first step on your journey to customer centricity. Um, you know, putting aside, there's obviously there's 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 budget limitations to buying data. Uh, there's questions as to the data integrity itself. There's, you know, like you said, marrying that data to your internal data, not an easy task to do. Um, I, I just kind of curious if you're if you're trying to gauge customer valuation and 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 the life cycle, the longevity of a customer. To me, it seems obvious that you would you would go out and start surveying your customers. But you know, a lot of people have issues with surveys, and I'm I'm kind of curious. What are your thoughts on survey data? Do you put much, you know, emphasis on it, or do you look at it with a grain of salt? Interesting. Uh, I, I, a little bit of both. So it's it's pretty rare for me to bring survey data into the lifetime value models themselves. Okay. But it's actually very very common to take different kinds of survey data and then layer that on top of the models after we've run them. And so the perfect example, and the and kind of as you're asking that survey question, you and every one of the folks are watching this <laughs> are thinking net promoter score, <laughs> um, right? Uh, which we right. all have this love hate relationship right. with, right? Uh, and so I've been doing a lot of work where after we run the lifetime value models, we'll ask ourselves for those really high value customers, how do their NPS scores or other kinds of survey based attitudinal measures compare with the with the so-so customers. So instead of just saying, oh, we've done our customer satisfaction thing and satisfaction is up, well, that by itself doesn't tell us anything. Does it mean that we've acquired more really good customers or that some of our really bad customers have left us or is everybody a little bit happier than before? So it's really under it's really important to understand how attitudes vary across the different kinds of lifetime value customer segments. Uh, and and there it can be extremely powerful to really understand what makes those high value customers tick. What are their unique wants and needs and frustrations and aspirations that are different than the so-so customers? And let's start to develop more product services messaging that would kind of lean into those particular uh, attitudinal characteristics. You know, so the takeaway really is that all those survey data might have be some helpful uh, it is not something that you're going to rely upon entirely. It needs to be used in conjunction. But let me say, okay. again, to sound a bit like a bit of a hypocrite, okay. uh, I'm sure a lot of folks are thinking, okay, how do I get started with this? It's going to take me a while before I collect all that, the, the transaction log data and be able to run lifetime value models. I'd like to at least have a quick and dirty initial something to start working with. And on that basis, something like a net promoter score. You know, are you a promoter or a detractor? It actually, for the most part, does line up reasonably well with lifetime value. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very initial quick and dirty metric to say, okay, we got the promoters here. We got the detractors there. How are they different? Um, let's, instead of, as we develop new products, try to come up with products that are, you know, universally beloved. Let's come up with things that are more beloved for those, for the promoters. So we can actually get out of the gate with right. a survey-based measure. Right. But you have to you know, make an absolute promise to yourself and everyone in the organization that we're going to make it a super high priority to 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 weave in and ultimately replace it with a more behavioral lifetime value type measure. Never abandon the NPS completely, but use it later on as just a layer on top of the behavioral models. You've been great, and we have. Uh, I, I have a couple more questions for you. I, I, I am, am trying to be respectful of your time. I know you just got back from a you know, big vacation, um, but before I let you go, first of all, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about theta and and customer based corporate valuation. What what I is that? Appreciate the chance to do so. Sure. You know, when we were running Zodiac, as I mentioned, one of our clients was a private equity firm, and they didn't care about any of the tactical marketing stuff. They just wanted to know. We're thinking of buying this, you know, digitally native women's cosmetics company. What's yeah. it worth? Yeah. 
And the value of it, instead of just saying, what is its EBITDA and let's multiply by some made up number, again, a, a, a dance that everyone watching this knows all too well, um, let's do it the right way. Let's do it from the bottom up. Let's ask the questions, how many customers are they acquiring? How long are they staying? How often are they buying? How much are they spending? Mm. Again, fundamental behavioral questions. Let's add all that up and say, that's the value of the firm. Customer-based corporate valuation. So as we sold Zodiac to Nike back in 2018, this uh, one private equity firm begged us to keep on going with it. And we did. And that's what Theta does. And so we've been working mostly with uh, PE firms to help them in the diligence process. Mm. But today, our non-compete with Nike has expired. So we're also back to doing the tactical stuff as well. So one way or another, it's using customer value for the marketing side, for the finance side, trying to build a bridge between the two. The ultimate project is when we work with a private equity firm, we show them that there's a lot of value in that, you know, in that uh, what, whatever, chain, restaurant, whatever. Um, uh, and then they buy it and then they bring us in to help with the tactics after they've acquired it. And once again, building a bridge between the folks making the day-to-day -day marketing decisions and the folks who have to be held accountable by shareholders, ultimately by Wall Street, mm. uh, and, and to be able to do that using the same metrics, the same models, the same language, creating that kind of real alignment uh, is, has been amazing. Uh, it's been, again, uh, very gratifying to see the success of this work through Theta, uh, but it takes us right back to the current book. Sure. which is before we even worry about the models, before we do the forecast, let's just look at the data we have and see what it looks like and understand what the patterns are. Uh, let's walk before we can run. So that's why this book, the customer-based audit, has no models, no forecast, no lifetime value in it. It's just, let's just look at the data we have and try to hold ourselves accountable on a regular periodic basis to say, is our customer base looking more or less healthy than it was a year ago at this time? Why this is important, and and Pete, you know, you've been giving us so much great advice, you know, on 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 business and marketing and valuing your customers yourself. Let me sort of return the favor because, uh, you know, again, as I, I tell you, with all the people that I talk to, you know, the average age of the U.S. small and mid-sized business owner is fifty-five years old. It's an aging population; like more than half are over the age of fifty. Uh, there is uh, a, a continuing trend and a recent explosion of companies selling themselves, you know, people right, wanting to sure. retire and succession planning has become a super hot topic. And every client that I talk to as a CPA, uh, they, you know, they, they address their valuation in the ways that you just described. It's a bit, uh, it's an asset-based approach, you know, it's, you know, with, with maybe a little bit of goodwill sprinkled on top with some, mm -hmm. you know, intangible estimates of what our business value might be worth based on a location or our customer's. What Theta is doing, if it if it was ever able to be more commoditized and scaled, is would be such a, you know, a huge, huge benefit to so many business owners to say, hey, listen, if you're going to buy my company, I realize my balance sheet might say this, or my EBITDA may say that, which is all based on the past, and we know the past does not equal the future. If you were to look at the value of our customers, that is the true valuation of our business. And if people had a way of figuring that out, by auditing their customer base just that much better, uh, it might have a significant impact on on not only the valuation of their business, but what they can sell their business for. And retirement. just overall business practice. And that's exactly right. And I can tell story after story, company that we worked with just a few months ago, a specialized bookseller that is, is exactly the story you told. You know, family held, they, they wanted to put them up, uh, themselves up for sale. Yep. Um, we came in and basically showed that there's all this juicy, delicious, customer locked in data. customer value that's yeah. not just directly showing up on the balance sheet, but, but there's a degree of stickiness there that's going to persist for a long time. Yeah. And the new cohorts of customers they're bringing in are just as good as the ones they brought in 10 years ago. Um, and they had a particular price in mind in the usual top-down way. And we said that they were actually worth tens of millions of dollars more than they thought. Mm. Uh, and then when we uh, did the whole, you know, I uh, forget what you call when you have a kind of auction thing with all the investment banks, mm -hmm. they brought us in there to basically demonstrate that this is the case and they ended up selling for, again, tens of millions more than they thought. And I realized that on that one project alone, that one project, had more 
financial impact than all of the other work that I had done for the previous 30 years of my career combined. Uh, and that's why I'm really motivated by the scenario that you painted. And it really is a win-win that if we can make these kinds of methods more uh, you know, rule than exception and get people to really understand those customer assets, not only when it's exit time, but even on you know day-to-day, quarter-to-quarter planning uh, so that you're setting yourselves up uh, to be in the right position uh, for right. that exit whenever it's going to come around. So that's one part of it. And then, of course, the flip side of it is the, the investment banks, this, all the search funds out there who are looking for the businesses that are watching this right now yeah. are starting to bring in these kinds of analyses to understand, well, what is that business really worth? So buy side, sell side, uh, it makes sense both ways. And it really should, the, the conversation should be, which kind of data we're we using? What kinds of inferences can we make? How well are the models working? As opposed to, should we do this this kind of analysis at all? You know, there's theory and there's practicality. This, um, I, I have to say, I mean, this book is, uh, it, it, it is a guideline. It is a playbook. It is, it is an instructional manual for really figuring out the value of your customers before you even start applying any methodology to, to leverage that. It's auditing your customer base um, and all the things that you should be considering and doing. But Pete, how, do you do you expect people to do that? I mean, it's pretty complex stuff. I mean, other than the largest of brands out there, what do you what do you want your readers to take away after reading this book? Do you want do you, do you think this book will help them do this kind of analysis on their own? Or will that at least make them think um, about working with somebody like yourself or other people in the valuation world uh, to help them along that journey? So it kind of goes back to the, the, uh, the discussion we had about customer centricity as a whole, which is a lot of them are doing some of this stuff already. So every time I post something on LinkedIn about, about the book, uh, I'll get all these comments from people saying, you know, I'm already doing a bunch of this kind of stuff. You know, thanks for justifying it and giving me some other things to think about. So, so part of it are the people who are waking up and smelling the data. And again, you, you uh, mentioned a, a lot of folks starting to do that. Others will be getting them to wake up and smell the data if they've been, for whatever reason, resisting all along. Uh, I, I'll be the first to admit that uh, if you read the book, it's not instantly obvious how to do all those analyses. And that's why we're working on a follow-up book right now. It's kind of the, it's almost the, the, the cookbook companion to this one. Good. So now that you understand what all those analyses are, and we haven't even gotten into the details, the five lenses and cohorts and what all the stuff in the book. Um, so let's show you in Excel how you can actually replicate each of these different kinds of graphs and tables uh, on your own data. This is the course that Bruce Hardy and Michael Ross are teaching over in London Business School and their students. Now, granted, those are MBA students. They you know, might be slightly different than the, the business stars you're talking about, but they, they find it eye-opening. They, they, uh, some of them say, this should be our core marketing course. We don't need to learn about four Ps and all that kind of stuff. We yeah. need to learn how to frame our data to make the best argument about tactics and strategies. So yes, I do want this to, to, to change the way people are doing business across the board, big and small, B2B, B2C. And I really do believe that not tomorrow, not the day after, not a year from now, but a generation from now, as the next generation start taking over these businesses and they're much more data savvy and they're asking these questions and leaning into them and not doing it reluctantly, they will be doing this kind of thing on a regular basis, both for internal and external purposes. Uh, and, uh, and I'd love to get some credit for that, but I just wanna see it happen regardless of, of who they're, uh, who, who's guiding them along the way. Pete Fader, along with Bruce Hardy and Michael Ross are the authors of the customer-based audit, the first step on the journey to customer centricity. Pete, it was great speaking with you. Love the book, looking forward to the next step on the journey. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Gene, truly a pleasure. It really is you and your audience that's in a position to, you know, to, to drive this stuff more than, than anybody else. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and would be delighted if anyone wants to follow up and, uh, and, and learn more. And where can we get a hold of you? Well, I'm easy to find. You can just Google my name uh, uh, and you'll find my, my Wharton page as well as go to thetaclv.com to see some of the practical stuff we, we've been doing. And then I'll also share just a bunch of links and things that, that you can put out there associated with this. You got it. 
Pete, thanks very much. And thank you for listening or viewing to this episode of Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks. I'll be back in another two weeks with another great author, but probably not as smart as Pete, uh, talking about their business book and how it can hopefully help you. We'll see you again soon. Take care.